to the book of Habakkuk. So far, we have studied Habakkuk's frustration at the Lord as he asked, How long will I cry out for help and you not answer? And then we looked at God's reply to Habakkuk, which really shook him to the core, because God told him that he was going to raise up the Chaldeans, a nation so much more evil than Judah, to invade Judah. And they would destroy and capture its people and the land. We studied how Habakkuk waited on the Lord to answer him for a second time, to clarify what, he was, be what was being said. And we looked at the first three woes that God pronounced to Habakkuk. And today we're going to finish off the woes, the last two. And then when, when I return, we're going to look at the final chapter in this book. Well, verses 15 to 17 describes a woe that is aimed at those who make their neighbors drunk so they can look on their nakedness. Woe to you who make your neighbors drink, who mix in your venom, even to make them drunk so as to look on their nakedness. You will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. Now you yourselves drink and expose your own nakedness. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you, and utter disgrace will come upon your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, and the devastation of its beasts by which you terrify them. Because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town, and all its inhabitants. Some pretty strong words. The Babylonians, or as they're called in this book, the Chaldonians, they had a reputation for drunkenness and cruelty. They were like those about whom in the book of Philippians, Paul says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. They loved the evil they did to others. They reveled in their power over others, in controlling them, in taunting and mocking them, in humiliating and killing them. In verse 15, God is calling them out on how they treat others. You make them drink, he says. You mix in your venom and get them drunk so you can look on their nakedness. In other words, God is saying, you're putting them in a position where you can take advantage of them physically and emotionally, and use them for your own glory and pleasure. Well, guess what, guys? In my timing, the tables are going to be turned over on you, and you're going to experience the very same things. God does not take this type of sin lightly. Exposing someone's nakedness, taking advantage of them when they are in a weakened state does not Please, God. Back in Genesis chapter 9, we read part of Noah's story. After the flood, Noah planted a vineyard. And when the grapes were ready, he made wine. And he drank until he got drunk. And he lay naked in his tent. His son Ham entered his father's tent and he saw his father's nakedness. And then he went out and he told his brothers all about it. Well, his two brothers then entered the same tent, but they went with a very different intent. They entered in backwards, walking backwards, holding a garment between them so they could cover up their father's nakedness, to cover up his shame. When Noah awoke and found out what Ham had done to him, Noah cursed him. Ham was to become a servant to his brother. Today we hear a lot about people being taken advantage of, and not just sexually, but through power and position, money. Those who have the power and the means to take advantage of others will be exposed by God in his time for what they truly are, and he will judge their sin. You see, we cannot treat people who have been made by God and in God's image with disrespect and hate and contempt. He will not let that go unpunished. 
Today, we're recognizing truth and reconciliation day. If you think of our history, how many of our First Nations people have been taken advantage of and abused by those who disregard the reflection of God seen in each and every person? Let's take that a little deeper. How is your attitude toward our First Nations people? Do you look upon them with respect and love as you would any other people group? Or is there a callous disrespect for them? Of course, we can ask that, ask that same question of any ethnic group, can't we? Anyone we interact with. Because you see, the image of God, our Creator, is in each and every person. So do we see that? Or do we turn up our noses and walk away, or even worse, do we abuse and take advantage of them? Do we shame them? In verse 16, it states that the cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you. And he's talking to Babylon. Babylon, you're going to face this cup. And the cup is referred to in Scripture as God's wrath and judgment. There is no way for them to escape what God has for them to drink. In Daniel chapter 5, we read of the last king in the dynasty of the Babylonians. His name was Belshazzar. And although his father had come to a recognition of who God was, Belshazzar did not. He mocked God. And one night in a drunken stupor at a, par a party in the palace, he called his servants to go and to bring out the cups that his father had stolen from the temple in Jerusalem. And he and his nobles and his wives and his concubines, they used these sacred cups to drink from and to toast their gods. And the disrespectful use of those cups brought about a frightening and fatal experience in Belshazzar's life. As they were with so much glee desecrating these sacred cups, a hand suddenly appeared on the wall for all to see, and it wrote four words. Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. Terrified of what he was seeing, Belshazzar allowed his mother to summon Daniel and Daniel explained the warning to him. It meant that God had had enough. Mene meant that God had numbered Belshazzar's kingdom and was going to put an end to it. That was it. It was done. And God wrote it twice to make sure that they understood. To count meant that Belshazzar himself had been weighed by God and he was found very lacking. And Parson meant that God had decided to give Belshazzar's kingdom over to the Medes and the Persians. And that very same night, Belshazzar was killed and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom. The cup of wrath. Sometimes it might feel to us like God is slow in acting. Sometimes we feel like he is just never going to do what we think he should do. But we must learn to be like Habakkuk and wait for God's timing. Because you see, God does not ignore sin and evil. But his timeline and his vision is very different than ours. He will not let sin go unpunished. But retribution comes in his way, not ours. In verse 17, God says, Because of the violence done to Lebanon, the devastation of the animals in the land, and the human bloodshed, you, Babylon, will be overwhelmed and terrified. The mention of Lebanon here can mean a couple of different things. You see, Lebanon was known for its beautiful trees. They were large and, and just absolutely beautiful. And so it's a possibility that while the Babylons were working their way across the land, that they just destroyed the forests of Babylon so they could create a road through it. And then they used the, the lumber to make their weapons of war. But it's also possible that this was a way of, 
of um, talking about the destruction that they did to the temple because they destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and the temple was built with the cedars of Lebanon. We're not really sure. But in any case, God was not happy with the destruction of the land. And it seems that the animals didn't fare any better in their hands, in Babylon's hands, because God accused them of devastating the beasts as well. Now maybe it was a natural um, uh, response or reaction to, to the deforestation that had happened, or maybe they just decided to kill off as much of the food supply to the people as they could. We don't know. But anyway, God is not happy. His creation reflects his glory. And by destroying it needlessly, the Babylonians were mocking God. And God tells Habakkuk, they will pay. So what about us? How do we treat others? Shameful? Do we glory in their destruction and in their pain? Do we take advantage of others for our own benefit? And what about the natural world? Do we do our best to care for it? To use it wisely? Or are we adding to the destruction of the land and the animals? God sees. God knows. And he will judge and we move on to verses 18 to 20, and it reads, What profit is the idol when its maker has carved it or image a teacher falsely? Or its maker trusts in his own handiwork when he fashions speechless idols? Woe to him who says to a piece of wood, Awake, to a mute stone, arise. And that is your teacher? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all inside. The Lord is in this holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. This is the last of the woes in this book. And it is directed at idolatry. Babylon had a host of gods to worship. But you know who their biggest idol was? It was themselves. When King Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah, he rejoiced in his strength. He rejoiced in his power and in his glory. It was all about him. And as the king does, so does the kingdom. In Daniel chapter 4, we read of a troubling dream that the king had one night after he had conquered Judah. And he called Daniel in to interpret it. And Daniel warned that although, yes, you are a great and mighty king, Nebuchadnezzar, and you rule a vast dominion, because you do not give glory to God, you do not obey his commands, the kingdom is going to be taken from you for seven years, and you're going to become like an animal, living out in the wild and eating grass. Your hair is going to grow like feathers, your nails like claws, and then after those seven years, when you finally come to your senses and you finally acknowledge who God is and that the glory belongs to him, your mental stability will return to the kingdom and <coughs> once again be handed over to you. What profit is the idol when the maker has carved it? It does not do us any good to create idols for ourselves or to think so highly of ourselves that we make everything about us and we become our own God. Because guess what? We are not God. Anything that we place in a position that overshadows God in our lives is idolatry and it is a sin. One that God will not overlook. He tells us himself in Exodus chapter 20 verses 3 to 6, he says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol or any likeness of what is in the heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water below the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth. 
fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. And verse 19 gives us a look into why idols are so different from our God. It's because they're dead. They're mute. They may be overlaid with gold and silver, but they have no breath. And that's it, right there. There's no breath. You see, our God is alive. And he breathed, breathed into his creation to awaken us and give us a voice right at the very beginning. And every time we choose to worship things that only lead to death and destruction instead of life and beauty, we are rejecting our creator and our savior. Our God not only breathed into us life, but as Jesus came to die and to rise again to redeem us from our sins, he asks for our worship. And yet so often, we create our own idols. And idols are not just physical things. They're not just things we place on a shelf and look at. They can be anything or anyone that we love and we serve more than God. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells a rich young ruler that there's only one thing holding him back from following God completely. It was his money. Jesus said to him, go and sell your belongings, give the money to the poor, then you can follow me. But that ruler, he couldn't do it. He had lots of money, and it was an idol in his life, and he could not let go of the one thing that he truly worshipped. So what about us? Do we have idols in our lives? Are there obsessions or mindsets that we hold close and cling to, knowing that God is not pleased yet, we can't seem to let go? Have we made other people into idols? Choosing to focus all our time and our energy and love into them instead of God. And there's food, social media, our careers, our possessions. Is there a place of idolatry in our life that we need to let go of? in order to place God back on the throne where he belongs. And verse 20 closes out our study today. It says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Here, God is letting Habakkuk know two things. First of all, he is the one in control. He is in his holy temple, and make no mistake, God knows what is going on in this world, and he will do it. <coughs> Second, we need to be silent before him. Now that word translated silent in the original language, it can mean hush, hold your tongue, Hold your peace and be still. You see, we need to be still and to know, to really experience that He is God. We need to close our mouths and open our ears so we can listen to what He has to say. Because He is God and we are not. He will make all things right in his time. And our part is to hear and obey. It's to tell others of the redemption that he has provided. It's to welcome them into the family of God and embrace them. But in order to do all of those things, we must be surrendered to him in everything that we do and say and think and in how we love. Psalm 636 is going to lead.